To discuss the additional sanctions approved by the EU, we now cross live to John Griffin, who's a Republican politician from Texas. Thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, Russia has helped to broker the truce that is currently in place in eastern Ukraine. Why did the EU still go ahead uh, with approving additional sanctions? Well, you know what, that's a great question. And in connection with the United States and its involvement in Ukraine, I really think that this is utterly ridiculous. Uh, the hypocrisy inherent in this move is, uh, is palpable. Uh, the U.S. and its European allies invade countries for any and every reason, and Russia has a legitimate energy interest in preserving peace and stability in Ukraine. Its pipeline is the sole pipeline to supply uh, oil and natural gas to most of Western Europe, so this is highly uh, uh, counterproductive to the interests of both the European Union, the United States, and Russia itself. And I think many of us uh, across, the, across the pond uh, would like to see us move in the other direction. Uh, EU officials also said that the actions uh, will take effect or will be revised only uh, in a few days after the assessment of how the ceasefire in eastern Ukraine holds up. How could this then affect the peace uh, process or the peace efforts on the ground? Well, beyond the issue of peace is the fact that we have instability in the financial markets, and the Russian Federation has said that it will be forming a currency zone with China, uh, and it, it will be diversifying away from dollars, and this could ripple throughout the U.S. market, the European markets, and cause, uh, cause substantial uh, financial turmoil, and this is something we need to be thinking about uh, in the European Union and the United States before we advocate and pursue new sanctions. As far as peace on the ground, I think Russia wants peace. I think the people of Ukraine simply want to go back to business as usual. This is not World War II. This is not Lebensraum, as some have said. This is not imperialism. This is simply Russia protecting its energy interests. And the United States and Europe should be encouraging this, should be encouraging this move towards stability, not trying to punish Russia, not trying to punish the economies of all of our nations and our consumers with these types of uh, really uh, counterproductive moves. Let's go back to, uh, I want you to elaborate a little bit more on the economy side of things. Uh, these sanctions that are being imposed on Russia or, or vice versa, uh, America doesn't really feel them. The EU is mostly going to be affected by uh, whatever uh, uh, Russia decides to do with these new sanctions that have come out. So is it fair to say that uh, Brussels could have tried other measures to promote peace instead of just going for what you've just said, counterproductive sanctions? Very much. And, and I'm an advocate of a new Plaza Accord or Louvre Accord uh, that would adjust the consumer balance uh, across the, uh, the, G, the G20 uh, because I think we've reached a fever pitch where the U.S. dollar is no longer able to be used as an imperial tool and other nations are looking at their options. Uh, I know that, uh, that Russia is now looking at um, you know, uh, using its own currency. China is looking at using its own currency in international trade. And this has rebalanced things substantially. Our consumers, uh, you know, our consumers aren't the only consumers anymore. Uh, Chinese consumers number some 300 million. That's their middle class, according to one estimate. That's as large as the entire U.S. population. So the U.S. and the European Union are no longer in the position to make these types of grandiose uh, unconditional, uh, unconditional threats, um, we have to begin looking at things that advance the interests of peace for all countries involved in the region. And as you said, we don't feel these sanctions. In many, in many cases, Russia doesn't feel these sanctions. It's entirely ludicrous in a globalized marketplace for us to be using 19th century tools. Time to change how we do business. That's John Griffin there, Republican politicians in Texas. Thank you very much for your time and your thoughts on this. Thank you. These days, we hear a lot about hacking and cybersecurity. There is one aspect, however, few focus on. The United States giving up its control of the Internet and doing it voluntarily, particularly when it comes to selling domain names to countries. RT's Alexei Yashevsky looks at one case where hundreds of thousands of those were given up to China. Jeff Barron was seen as one of the Internet pioneers. I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to develop some software in the late 1990s, and we were able to register some very 
uh, valuable, good domain names like rewards.com, servers.com. His $100 million company, Ondova, ran the domain creation. This is a guy who had, uh, who had around a $100 million company. Um, he had around 80 million unique visits per day to his sites, and he had one million domain names that he controlled. But after a business dispute between Barron and his business partner landed the company in a courtroom, Jeff became the first person in the post-slavery era in America to go into human receivership, with a federal judge in Texas stripping him both of his material wealth and his civic rights. But the most surprising thing came later, when Barron's assets ended up not quite in a place you would expect. The court seized uh, these assets that belonged to these companies and they sold them off when the court, according to the higher court, didn't have jurisdiction to do that. There were, I, my recollection is there was about 350,000 internet domain names. And a lot of those domain names did end up uh, in, in China. The domain names sold by the U.S. court to Chinese and other foreign countries ranged from simple three-letter websites to the longer ones. But there was always one common denominator, the dot-com extension. Imagine the Internet as the real estate market. So in this case, the dot-com domains would be the elite houses, large pompous villas, while all other domains would be, you know, affordable, cheap housing. But regardless, now imagine somebody with bags of cash rolling in and buying off all property in a neighborhood. Easy to imagine that in either case, such individual would have a major say on how things are run in such community. And this is exactly the concern that investigative journalist John Griffin has when it comes to the Chinese buying off those domains. Now uh, we have a bunch of non-Western countries like Iran who censors the, who censors the internet, uh, monitors what their people look at online. China, same thing. Uh, competing now against Russia, the United States, Britain, Germany for influence over what has traditionally been a very open, equal, uh, and competitive space. When China gets 51% control of all DNS addresses, it also then can dictate to the rest of us, to Russia, to the United States, what we will see online, how we will consume news online. Such interest from the land of the dragon is not new. Barron's assets were given up in 2013, but this blog post from two years ago suggests selling the domain names to China was quite a profitable business. The person who wrote this outlined the pricing, at times going to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that the market is hot and that the Chinese own it. But the most bizarre part is that America is doing this to itself not only signified by Barron's case, but also by letting go of U.S. government's grip on domain name system, or the DNS, last year to a non-profit company called ICANN, which has governments and foreign businesses among its stakeholders. I think the risk is extremely serious that, um, that a foreign actor or a number of foreign actors could obtain control over ICANN and therefore essentially control the internet, at least for a short period of time. So in the instance of America being at war with some um, hostile foreign powers, if they were able to obtain control, the hostile powers are able to obtain control over the ICANN, over the internet, I think it puts the United States security in extreme jeopardy. The American uh, government has stood behind the internet historically, and that's what has made the internet what it is today. So simply restoring that not going further, not going further back, further forward, but restoring the system we had, I think would do a lot to alleviate these issues. The current media world is buzzing with everything cyber related. The story of U.S. giving up its domain assets to foreign governments, however, is not as sexy as unproven hacking allegations. So Jeff Barron, as well as a handful of internet activists, are waiting to see whether Trump's administration would take any steps at all to make the internet American again. Alexei Roshevsky, RT, reporting from Washington, D.C. Meantime, Derezor's children are trying to get back to some kind of normal life after the lifting of that siege. Not all the schools in the city are fully open, but some of the kids are already uh, back at school and they've started classes in this new school year. But not all Syrian children are lucky enough to be receiving an education right now. Human Rights Watch is reporting that millions of dollars pledged to get Syrian refugee children back to school simply hasn't reached them. And it says the international community is partly to blame, as Samira Khan's been finding out. A lost generation. That's precisely what global powers sought to prevent when they pledged to enroll all Syrian refugee children in school by mid-2017. But a lost generation is exactly what we're seeing. 
Donors and host countries have promised that Syrian children will not become a lost generation, but this is exactly what is happening. More transparency and funding would help reveal the needs that aren't being met so they could be addressed and get children into school. Despite international assistance to prevent this, over 500,000 Syrian children in Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan are still not receiving an education. According to Human Rights Watch, millions of dollars never reached, arrived late or couldn't be traced due to inadequate reporting. Major donor countries, the EU, US and the UK, all missed specific funded targets they had already committed to. The United States is announcing our latest contribution, new funding specifically to support schooling for 300,000 refugee youth in Jordan and Lebanon. First of all, I would like to thank countries like Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey who are willing to accommodate these people. They need our support. For 2016, the federal government would like to pledge 1.1 billion euros for the humanitarian aid programs of the United Nations. That was winter 2016, when the school year began, host countries Jordan and Lebanon were both massively underfunded. Winter 2017, same problem. Of course, it's not entirely the donor's fault. Certain policies of host countries have also created obstacles. In some Turkish provinces, Syrian refugees face delays in getting the identification required to enroll in public schools. And Lebanon hasn't even issued work permits to Syrian refugees. And as a result, families are often unable to afford school-related costs, pushing kids to work instead of going to school. We're not investing in the mechanisms by which that you can get monies to places as quickly as possible. And instead of governments being set up to do this in the right manner, we are typically looking at outside NGOs to do it. Some can do it with good success, depending, and some not. Until we uh, take monies from the military, which is typically where most countries are investing as far as in security needs rather than into development needs, um, it's gonna, this challenge is going to go over and over again. So while they may have good intentions, the international community may still be held responsible for helping create a lost generation. Samira Khan, RT, Washington, D.C. Well, when you look at the stats, Syria is on the verge of an educational crisis, certainly with 1.75 million children unable to attend school and 8.4 million Syrian children inside and outside the country in need of urgent humanitarian aid. And that's a worry. Investigative reporter John Griffin says that this lack of education and all the other problems could lead to more terrorism. As far as underdeveloped countries, uh, corrupt dictatorships, uh, there's an active effort to steal aid money, and that deprives people at, at, you know, at the worst possible place in their lives of the support and the assistance that they need. And look at terrorism in the region. Uh, people who get involved with terrorism are usually uh, the same kind of people who would be involved with violent crime on our streets in Western countries. They're uh, disadvantaged youth. They're people that need a reason to exist. They need a purpose. They haven't been able to find that purpose in traditional means like employment or uh, study because those things aren't available to them. So they turn to violence. They turn to terrorism. So that's a, a very real risk if we don't make sure that uh, these refugees are educated. The U.S. Democratic Party is under fire in the city of Detroit, where some locals were accusing the party of double standards, especially when it comes to race. The outrage was triggered by allegations of sexual misconduct against the House of Representatives' longest-serving member. Dozens of people gathered at a rally demanding due process, as you heard there, in the case of Democrat John Conyers, saying that the rule of law should be the same for everyone. Protesters claim that Conyers is being treated unfairly in comparison with similar allegations against another party member. John Conyers is accused of five cases of sexual misconduct and denies all of them. It's believed that some politicians are using his age and race to force his resignation. Meanwhile, the Democrats have apparently turned a blind eye to allegations against Senator Al Franken, whose career is well supported by the party. He's already admitted to one case of assault and has been accused of five more, but isn't facing calls to step down. I don't think that you can equate Senator Franken with, with Roy Moore. There's two different things. But I, I, it also, his accusers have to accept an apology. I pray for Congressman Conyers and his family and wish them well. However, Congressman Conyers should resign. 
Media commentator John Griffin says the American people are more concerned about serious crime rather than claims against politicians. Political reality is becoming a lot like reality television, to be quite honest. Uh, so much focus has been paid to scandals because it's so easy to distract people from what matters with accusations, in many cases baseless and unproven. This is really pandering to the lowest common denominator. When we're talking about issues that clearly don't matter to the people that actually are pushing them, like let's, let's look at the people who are pushing the sexual harassment controversy with Roy Moore. These are folks that can be heard on any other day defending General, actual rapists and Senator actual Chairman, pedophiles, okay? So uh, when we look at that, General, then we really have, we, we really can have a clear understanding that this is not really about that. It's about the policies that these individuals want to prevent from becoming law. Let's talk about those policies. Let's talk about our policy disagreements and let's stop throwing mud because it's really a waste of the people's time. FBI files have revealed that the agency's former director, James Comey, had his statements on Hillary Clinton's misuse of a private email server heavily edited. A U.S. Senate committee has been reviewing some of the changes to the documents. Here's just some of what they found then. First, there were repeated edits to reduce Hillary Clinton's culpability. Besides that, there are also references removed about the intelligence community's role in identifying vulnerabilities. And the Senate committee picked up on a downgrade of likely hostile actors that may have penetrated Secretary Clinton's emails. It's a twist, too. Some of the agents involved in the editing, it seems, were part of the same investigation team into allegations of collusion between Trump and Russia. Caleb Mopin breaks it all down. It turns out that detective work is not only for the FBI. At this point, many different U.S. institutions are engaged in investigations, and it can get pretty confusing. Trump Russia investigation. Right. A criminal investigation into President Trump for possible obstruction of justice. I've reopened the Clinton investigation. Investigation into a 2010 uranium deal that involved Russia. Now, I'm not a fan of the investigation. First, there was the probe into Hillary Clinton and her time as Secretary of State when she used a private server for her emails and compromised national security. We can call that probe number one. After that, lawmakers who were unhappy with the results launched a probe of their own to investigate the FBI's initial probe. We'll call that probe number two. This found that one of the FBI investigators, Peter Strzok, exchanged pro-Clinton and anti-Trump text messages with his colleague. Electronic records show that Peter Strzok changed former FBI Director James Comey earlier draft language describing Clinton's actions in handling classified materials from, quote, grossly negligent to extremely careless. So one of the FBI agents who was doing the investigation may not have been completely impartial. Now, I hate to bring it up again, but we all know about the ongoing investigation into allegations of Russia-Trump collusion. We can call that probe number three. So Agent Strzok is the link that connects all three. He was investigating Hillary Clinton, and he himself was investigated in probe number two. And he was investigating and working on probe number three before he was fired over those anti-Trump text messages. Republicans obviously were not pleased. He says, Trump is an effing idiot. What the F just happened to our country? What happens when people who are supposed to cure the conflict of interest have even greater conflicts of interest than those they replace? That's not a rhetorical question. At this point, it's pretty safe to say that the first three investigations were a mess. But Congress has come up with a solution. Point a second special counsel to look into this, to look into Peter Strzok, Bruce Orr, everything else we've learned in the last several weeks. You guessed it more investigations. Caleb Maupin, RT, New York. Well, U.S. political commentator John Griffin believes more probes, more investigations are pointless, though, and may even be illegally things. The bar has been set so low on this investigation, especially after all intelligence agencies have said that uh, there absolutely was no impact on vote tally, and there's even disagreement as to whether or not Russia did intervene in the U.S. election, especially after the DNC now came forward and said that their leaks were not related to a Russian hack. So uh, I think that, that any additional investigation would not only be superfluous, it would actually be a violation of uh, double jeopardy laws and protections in the Constitution. 
and it would amount to nothing more than a witch hunt. I think this neo-McCarthyism needs to stop. So it seems the only thing to fear this Halloween is having fun. Some schools have banned costumes and parades, all amid concerns they might offend religious or ethnic groups. If it's not your particular religion, and even if so, children don't dress up as their authoritative elders, somehow there's bound to be something negative about it. So it's a little hate mongering. Muslim sheikhs exist in the world. So if you dress up as a Muslim sheikh, what's the problem? shouldn't be offensive in any sort of way. It's just as much as any other costume in the world. These people have lived in history and, you know, there's nothing offensive. Somebody's going to be upset about something, so you can't make everybody happy all the time. It's become one more super consumer holiday, and now it's politically loaded. I would get rid of it. I think it's ridiculous, because those same schools are making those same kids stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, so what's the difference? And they don't have a choice to do that. They, they have to do that. Everything has become this kind of walking on eggshells, uh, tiptoe exercise in uh, human relationships. And when you have entire groups of, of African-American students at universities saying they want to self-segregate, calling it safe spaces, uh, totally eliminate any sort of uh, other racial uh, intermixing. I mean, that's, that's really kind of cultural reversion. That's going backwards, don't you think? Nobody that's sending their kid out onto the street for Halloween uh, wants to insult a group of people. Uh, you know, it, it's not really about that. And the fact that it's been made about that is just truly tragic.